first we knew it was this terrible noise, like the whole sub was groaning. It was obvious. It was an explosion. The thick steel skin of the silo split like an overripe banana. On October the 3rd, 1986, in the last days of the Cold War, Soviet submarine K-219 suffered a fatal accident in the Atlantic Ocean, just east of Bermuda. The only nuclear-powered missile submarine ever to be lost at sea. Igor Kurdin, an officer who'd served on the K-219, later made video recordings of the sub-survivors, preserving their testimony. Retold in this program using actors, their story is not just about the end of one Soviet sub, it's as much about the end of the Cold War itself. The K-219 had left port one month before, September the 3rd, under the command of a friend of mine, Captain Igor Britanov. The mission was to last three months, without natural light or clean air, from Gadjievo across the Atlantic to the American coast, and there to patrol. In the missile bay, 15 missiles, each with two nuclear warheads. Their function, to threaten the enemy with the same instant destruction with which they threatened us. As jobs go, it was crazy, sure, but also necessary. The Soviet submarine fleet was one vital part of the complex military jigsaw that made up the Cold War. Seen here on the surface in film released from the old Soviet naval archives, the subs on duty stayed submerged. The missiles aimed at American cities. Just as American and British submarines threatened cities in the east. This equal threat was balanced with the knowledge that should war come, the destruction too would be equal. The result, stalemate, peace through fear. But in the 1980s, the equal threat was becoming unequal. The nuclear balance, as the crew of the K-219 well knew, had shifted dangerously in America's favor. Our submarine, the K-219, it was a Yankee-class submarine, 20 years old. 20 years old. It should have been heading for the scrap heap, not out on patrol. Ten years before, she'd had a near-fatal accident. A missile silo had sprung a leak. Since then, we were one missile down. Silo 16 was welded shut. The sub's reactors were so old-fashioned, they were a danger. And we're fighting a modern war in such a submarine. We were too patriotic to admit it, but it was embarrassing almost. Engines all slow. Course 180. Sonar? Nothing, Captain. Meanwhile, the Americans, they had systems you would not believe. The truth was, almost every minute of our patrol, they knew where we were. When we left port, they had intelligence subs waiting, listening, marking us. Halfway across the Atlantic, a sonar fence, sensors underwater, crossing the entire ocean. There was no way through without them hearing us. Our ship had this creaking steel hull, whereas they had these new attack subs. They materialized like ghosts. They were silent, almost impossible to detect. Even to hear one was a privilege, something special. Wait. Oh, 
possible contact. Mark it. Keep on it. It didn't happen often. But we are a patriotic people, just like the Americans. And so we drove our clanking, obsolete vessels under the noses of a superior enemy. Just hoping the shortcuts would not take too much of a toll. From 1980, American defense spending had soared. America's president, Ronald Reagan, believed security came not through stalemate, but strength. He played on renewed American self-confidence, spending billions, eventually trillions of dollars on arms. Money the Soviet Union couldn't possibly match. American research even began pushing the arms race into space. Star Wars, as it became known. To some, such massive defense spending seemed dangerous. If high-tech American killer subs could now detect Soviet submarines before they fired their missiles, removing the risk of Soviet retaliation, what now could stop the Americans firing first? Stand by. For the Soviet Union, Reagan offered a choice. Either face bankruptcy in a new arms race, or give up the race altogether. The K-209, if you like, was a metaphor for the motherland herself. On the surface, a great force, able to defend herself, able to unleash terrible destruction. But if you looked more closely, the cracks were already so obvious. The drama had begun in the missile chamber on the very first day of the mission. It started as a minor leak in silo six. Department four, missile room, report. At that stage, Captain Britanov was not informed. The missiles officer, Petrashkov, had taken a gamble. Compartment four, manned and ready. Because, you see, sometimes on diving, these little leaks fix themselves. More to the point, Petrashkov had problems at home. His wife was sleeping with the head of the KGB in Gadjievo. He had no desire to return to port. So instead, he just ordered a seaman to keep an eye on the problem. It must be the muzzle gasket settling in. Whatever, I want it checked twice a day. If it goes above five litres, strip it out at once, do you understand? Yes, sir. And so the days passed. The leak increased, stabilised, increased a little more. An accident waiting to happen. Curdon's account describes in detail life on board a Soviet nuclear submarine, shown here again in Soviet naval archive. Slow weeks of routine, standing watch, eating, sleeping, standing watch again. Off duty, the submariners kill time reading or watching home movies of their wives and children back in port. Everyday scenes, everyday pleasures much the same in Soviet Russia as anywhere else in the world. But in these years of Cold War, it was easy to forget the basic humanity of your enemy. Reagan, in particular, liked to demonize the Soviet Union. He called it the evil empire, still bent after all these years on world domination. In 1979, the Soviet army had invaded Afghanistan to prop up the local communists there. It was a war they fought against their better judgment, not unlike the Americans in Vietnam. But it seemed to the West one more example of old-style Soviet aggression. As Reagan put it, Let us pray for the salvation of all of those who live in that totalitarian darkness. Pray they will discover the joy of knowing God. But until they do, 
let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man that predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. For as long as such hostility remained between the two sides, the game of cat and mouse would continue in the waters of the Western Atlantic. On the 14th day of the mission, the sonar operator of the K-219 detected the presence of an American killer submarine nearby. Bearing 095. He's diving. Calm down. It was an extraordinary thing. The tension was incredible. It was so rare that we should catch one of them napping. Later it emerged that this was the USS Augusta. Los Angeles class, state-of-the-art technology. The miracle was that they had not heard us. Captain, he's coming straight in. Calm down. I want one ping on the active set. Half power on my signal. It was typical of Britannoff. But this was not according to the book. Sending a blast of sound through the water, it was like thumbing his nose at the Americans, an act of such tremendous bravado. Now. Seven seconds. A wave of acoustic energy flowing through the water. And then... such a moment. It happens perhaps once in a Soviet captain's career. But confidence can be a bad thing. Because two weeks later, on October the 3rd, Britannov sensed the Americans trailing him once again. And this time he planned a move so bold it proved his undoing. The Americans call it a crazy Ivan. A sharp, twisting dive, forcing the pursuer into a humiliating reverse. At the best of times, a crazy Ivan strains the fabric of the vessel. But to attempt a crazy Ivan in a leaking sub... Let's put it this way. Had Petrashkov informed the captain of the true state of affairs, what happened next might have been avoided. The sad irony of the K-219 was that though few people realized it yet, this 40-year-old game of superpower tag was already outdated. In March 1985, Konstantin Chernyenko had been buried in Moscow, the last of a line of elderly Soviet leaders of the old school. His successor, Mikhail Gorbachev, though still a communist, a party man, seemed to many in the West a breath of fresh air in Soviet politics. From the start, he'd criticized the faults in the Soviet system. Economic failure. The closed repressive political system. Bankruptcy. Caused as much as anything by the insane economics of the arms race. But for the K-219, such radical new thinking came too late. Well, how long has it been doing this? A day? A week? We had some seepage in the first dive. I was in the missile room. Petrachkov had finally felt it wise to alert somebody to the gravity of the situation. But then, without warning, in the control post, Vitanov called the crazy Ivan. F-100, make turns for 25 knots, run out hard left, down, out! I remember reaching out. And then at once the emergency systems kicked in. Pump head! Pump head! 
But already there was gas. Our only chance was to vent the missile. It's all! Take me! We have a major leak in state! Flash forward! Flash forward! the noise of the explosion. It's a terrible noise. The whole sub was groaning. Thick steel skin of the silo split like an overripe banana. What had happened? To explain simply, Seawater had reacted with missile fuel. The result? Nitric acid, blowing the missile out of its silo and belching out poison gas. But Trachkov and two others died instantly. The poison ate away the rubber seals from compartment to compartment. Britanov, in the command post, was cut off from the hundred or so men under his command. Request emergency assistance. All units, respond! What they faced was meltdown, nuclear meltdown, a vast fireball of radioactive steam polluting the Gulf Stream. A meltdown similar to that about to happen on the K219 had occurred at Chernobyl, a nuclear power station in the Soviet Ukraine, just five months earlier. The force of the explosion had blown apart the reactor's steel roof. The radiation spill was so bad, 135,000 people had to be resettled. Chernobyl was public proof of how obsolete Soviet technology had become. As one American writer put it later, Russia seemed little more than a third world country with a bomb. But for as long as those bombs remained on either side, so too did the potential for another, even more terrible disaster. As it turned out, meltdown was avoided. And all because of the heroism of one young seaman. His name was Preminen. In the command post, Britanov listened as Preminen kept up a running commentary, entering the intense heat of the reactors to shut them down by hand. Minin was subjected to dreadful doses of radiation. He succeeded in his task, but lost his life in the process. Casualty number four. By this time, the fate of the K-219 was a news story across the world. Good evening. A Russian nuclear-powered submarine with 16 missiles on board... American intelligence took photos of the stricken sub, which in the White House Reagan studied with genuine concern. For all Reagan's warlike talk, he was horribly aware of the high stakes of this nuclear game. He'd always hoped to avoid war by arming himself to the hilt, but accidents like this showed the risk in such a policy. Two weeks later, he met with Gorbachev for summit talks in Reykjavik in Iceland. Whether the accident on the K-219 was on their minds, not known. But what happened in the two days that followed began a process which was to end the Cold War for good. I'm always up. 
To the amazement of their advisors, the two world leaders simply rewrote the rules of the arms race. You know, we have lots of issues to discuss with the president. They discussed removing missiles from Europe, phasing out ballistic missiles, cutting bomber fleets. As Gorbachev put it later, they showed between them the world could be improved. Meanwhile, Britannov had evacuated his crew to a Soviet merchant ship nearby. But word came through from Moscow that he was to order the men back on board to try as best they could to return the sub to Russia. Without enough breathing apparatus, it would have meant certain death. We were on the merchant ship. We had a call through from Chinyavin himself, the admiral of the fleet. He says the OBAs were delivered. There's no reason not to proceed. He wants to talk to you. But Britanov just refuses to speak to him. Tell him my batteries are dead. Tell him he can't get through. Defying Chinyavin. <laughs> it's like asking to be shot there and then. And there was this sound, this whoosh. We rushed out. We saw the submarine tipping, sinking. And we realized at once what he'd done. Rather than risking our lives returning, he had opened the floodgates, scuttled the sub. They were all taken to Cuba, Britannoff included. He survived. There they were arrested and flown back to Moscow. But you see, times were changing so fast. Those like Chernyavin, the old war horses, they were pensioned off. Those for whom the system was more important than human life. So instead of a bullet in the neck, Britannoff received an honorable discharge. He dropped out for a while lost touch with us all. But then, years later, there was a ceremony in Gajievo, surrounded by the rusting hulks of the Russian Navy. And down the hill came his familiar figure, the man who put the lives of his men before the party. And there was a shout, Britanov, Britanov. And to see him smiling, it was possible to believe. Even with his old country dead, and his new one struggling to find a place in the world, the Britannoff's own life could begin again. <laughs>